Um, so the title of my talk was listed as Considering Success in Language Revitalization. But after sending my title and abstract in, just the other day I started thinking seriously about this trip. <coughs> so I happened to review the original invitation from Sarah, um, which jolted my memory. <laughs> where she wrote, one of the main areas we would like to address at this conference is language documentation and determining if we have documented our languages well enough. And if not, which is the general consensus among folks right now, to put a, in a place a plan to do so. So I've modified the talk. You, you can keep the title, but there's now a subtitle. So it's now Considering Success in Language Revitalization, the Role of Documentation. So I'll start out with a success story. Um, I'd like to talk about Daryl Baldwin. A lot of you know Daryl Baldwin, so you may have heard these stories about him before. He's, um, his story is one of the success stories in language revitalization. I first heard about Daryl from our student, David Costa, years ago, who now works full time for the tribe at the Miami Center at Miami University in Ohio. David was writing his dissertation on the Miami language, an Algonquian language. He'd searched for speakers of the language throughout the Midwest, but hadn't found anybody who knew more than a few words. But he did find a whole lot of documentation on the language in archives around the country. Enough that he decided that he could analyze the various records he found and write a dissertation on Miami syntax. This is David now. And indeed he did, and it was brilliant. He had met Daryl Baldwin um, during his quest and developed a friendship with him. Daryl at that time was a carpenter married with two young children. And he had a strong desire for most of his life to learn about the Miami language, but thought it was impossible because the last speakers had died even before he was born. He was fascinated with David's plan to write a grammar of the language and could hardly wait until it was finished. So the day came when the completed dissertation arrived in his mailbox. And uh, so Daryl ripped the package open and started reading, but realized he couldn't understand a word. So his solution was to go back to school and get an MA in linguistics. Daryl learned the mastery of the linguistese language he learned to understand the grammatical structures that David was describing. He went back to the original documents that the information was mined from and learned to find other documents and mine them on his own. As he learned all this, he started to use his language. And you know, I think use should be thought of as some, a somewhat different thing than learn. So when Kate was saying the goal of the commission is to create speakers. I was thinking, no, the goal of the commission might be to create users. That users, it's a little bit of a different uh, thing than speakers. In fact, uh, there's probably a number of speakers here who aren't users, right? So even, even the people that know how to speak the language may not be using it. Um, so he started to use his language. So every word that he learned, he started using it at home. He plastered the names of household items all over the house. And even if he was talking English most of the time at the beginning of his venture, he would always use the Miami word or phrase if he knew it. His primary motivation was to make sure his kids grew up with a sense of Miami identity and the language was a big part of that. He and his children with the family growing to four kids came to use Miami about half the time together. His wife, Karen, although not as fluent as Daryl became, was nevertheless a strong supporter of the language. And being a certified school teacher, she homeschooled the children all the way through elementary and junior high school grades to help increase their exposure to the language and the culture and the sense of being Miami. His oldest children are adults now, and Daryl proudly says that all four of his kids are more fluent than he is. His son Jared is a Miami language teacher at the college and in summer camps. His daughter Jessie is married and has a baby about nine months old and is uh, committed to bringing her up with Miami and uh, language and culture as a big part of her life. <clears throat> 
Meanwhile, the Miami tribe, with Daryl um, and colleagues of his leading, uh, has developed a very strong partnership with Miami University, and Daryl has helped uh, develop a program there, or has developed a program there for Miami students and has founded the Miami Center. Language revitalization is going strong now in the community between the university, summer language and culture camps for families, and the development of books, materials, and programs to disseminate to the Miami people all over the country. Um, and the Miamis are learning about their language and, their, and learning their language, learning to use their language and use their culture in reclaiming Miami as part of their identities. So all of this started with documentation. The Miamis are very lucky because they're finding more and more documentation in all of the archives around. They, they haven't even found all the archives yet that have documentation uh, on Miami language. Daryl uh, predicts that they have only found in mind about a third of the documentation that exists. So documentation then is an enormous part of language revitalization. Whether it was done long ago before anyone thought about language loss or revitalization, or whether it's being done now. In the case of Miami, there was a vast amount of written documentation, but no sound recordings. So Daryl knows that while he can have a general understanding from the writings of how the language is pronounced, he can never get the earlier native speaker pronunciation or full knowledge of the cadence, intonation, and rhythm of speech that Miami had when it was the everyday language of a speech community. Some languages have early recordings dating back to the days of wax cylinder recording at the end of the 19th century. Now, these are gold. But in some cases, the recordings are mainly songs rather than spoken language. Those are gold, too. And yet one might yearn for hearing more speech. Over the decades, as recording technology got easier, there are more and more recordings of stories, songs, reminiscences, and descriptions of traditional activities, all in Native American and First Nations languages. Most common, though, are the recordings of individual words and paradigms all absolutely, completely useful. But in language revitalization, people using documentation wish for more. So there's always more to do. One important example is informal conversation, which is so different from monologues and paradigms. Technology, along with awareness of what's been lacking in the past um, in the way of documentation, is allowing conversational documentation to take place now. And there's at least two people in this conference, Marianne Methune and Larry Kaimura, who know a whole lot about the importance of documentation of conversation and how to do it. Um, in 1992, I was lucky enough to be part of the founding of what's now a venerable nonprofit organization, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival run by an all-native board of people representing tribes from around California, we developed two flagship programs. One of them, the Master Apprentice Language Learning Program, and the other one, the Breath of Life Language Restoration Workshops. In 1992, and even now, many native people see a dark side to language documentation. The new board of the advocates resisted any suggestion to form a documentation project of the endangered languages of California. There are several aspects to this reaction against documentation, but the main one being expressed then was documentation doesn't save our languages. Developing new speakers is what will save our languages. One person said, I don't want my language to be pickled. I want it to be spoken. The Master Apprentice Program was based on this principle of asking the elder generations who still speak their language to work directly with younger tribal members, forming one-on-one -on -one teams who, were, who are taught principles of immersion and start living their lives together in their language, using the language in their daily activities. A book that came out of this program is known to some of you titled, How to Keep Your Language Alive. Uh, the program has spread out of California to other parts of the United States and Canada, Australia, even Sweden. Um, this has been a successful program in many ways, allowing the apprentices develop, uh, to develop conversational skills 
and sometimes very proficient, and for them to go on to teach the language to others or in the best of worlds, use it at home with their children to restore the cycle of transmission to new generations. It's not the only way to learn a language, um, and it's not even necessarily the best way to learn the language, but in many cases, it's the only way to learn a language if there's no other options available. And yet, in 1992, there were already over 30 um, Native American languages in California that had no living speakers at all. And so how could those communities without speakers be served? How could they ever develop new speakers? The answer had to be using whatever documentation there is of their languages. And that was the basis of our other um, our other program, the Breath of Life Workshops, which we developed uh, and held first in 1995. The Breath of Life Language Restoration Workshop is a one-week um, one workshop that takes place every other year at the University of California at Berkeley, where California Native people learn to navigate the archives of California languages that are there at the university and the cultural documents and recordings collected from the end of the 19th century over 100 years to the present. They get introduced to archival research, how to find the documentation on their language, and with the basic introduction to linguistic analysis in order to learn to read and pronounce the sounds of, of their language that they may see written there or that they may hear and how to figure out the grammatical structures portrayed in the linguistic field notes and text. Each language group has a linguist working with them to further their own ability to mine the language. We host between 40 and 60 participants each time from uh, 15 or 20 different languages to give them the beginning knowledge they need in order to proceed with their efforts on their own for the long term. The participants go to a different archive each day for the first few days. There are three main archives on our campus. And after that, they can focus in on the archive that has the most documentation for their language. They also visit the cultural materials at uh, the museums on campus. And each afternoon, there's practical lectures on linguistics to help them better uh, use the documentation they, they find. We give them homework each night, and at the end of the week, each language group gives a presentation of, research pro of a research project. We invited Daryl Baldwin to be one of the instructors in our Breath of Life um, workshop several times. He always brought his two older children with him and had them demonstrate and give Miami language lessons, partly to show the participants in the workshop what could be accomplished through working with documentation, and partly to train his children into being language advocates themselves, which he did very well. In 2011, we began to hold biennial Breath of Life events in Washington, D.C., called the National Breath of Life Archival Institute for Indigenous Languages. At the end of the 2013 Institute, Daryl volunteered to take over as the director, running the financial and organizational arms of the Institute through the Miamia Center. This institute is two weeks long and utilizes materials at the Smithsonian Institution, the Museum of the American Indian, and the Library of Congress. The Washington, D.C. Breath of Life Institute is for all North American indigenous languages, and there may be some people, well, there are some people here who have attended. I see Jordan, for example. Um, and I'd actually, anybody who did attend, I'd actually like to talk to you to get an update uh, for what you've been doing since you attended. And if you haven't been to the archives in Washington, D.C., you might be amazed at what you find. I know some groups uh, last year being completely overwhelmed with the amount of material there at their language. In California, and I recommend that you all um, come. The next one is in 2017. In California, where the Breath of Life workshops have been going on now for over 20 years, we see many new developments in language revitalization around the state where uh, the documentation is central. Some people have continued their study of documentation in California to become proficient in speaking and teaching their language. Um, Vincent Medina, Chicheno language, is one example. He, um, he speaks very proficiently. He holds uh, 
He holds little language groups of other Chochenyo people to, uh, to get together to use the language. He, um, he was recently asked to translate a psalm into Chochenyo and recite it when the Pope came to Washington, D.C., so he was there. Um, he now also works for um, the uh, magazine that we have in California called uh, News from Native California and has a, uh, um, a learn your lang or a, a speak your language column where uh, people from different language groups every, every uh, issue will have poems or stories of their own that they, uh, that they publish. Others have gone on to major in linguistics as undergraduates or graduate students. Louis Trevino of the Rumson language is now a student in linguistics at Berkeley, um, falling in love with it uh, uh, at Breath of Life. Lewis also keeps a Facebook page where he writes and shows the analysis of a phrase a day, focusing on specific domains. The last time I looked, for example, the phrases were all about emotions. All of these phrases are mined from the hundreds of pages of field notes made by J.P. Harrington, a posthumously famous ling linguist who dedicated his life to the documentation of endangered Native American languages, especially in California. Um, the uh, various Chumash languages have developed language revitalization in different ways, again, completely based on documentation since there's no speakers left alive. A uh, few short success stories here, for example, the Obispeño Chumash have developed a nonprofit group that has regular language gatherings for the Obispeños and ceremonial events, while some of the Ineseños have advanced far enough to develop immersion classes for children. Two Barbareño Chumash young women are applying to graduate school now in linguistics. Uh, Karina Luna, a Mutsunoloni woman, and Robert Geary, an Eastern Pomo man, met at Breath of Life. I used to call this the, uh, I used to call Breath of Life the Lonely Hearts Language Club. <laughs> and they eventually married. They both use uh, languages, at, their languages at home these are unrelated languages, with their combined family from previous marriages of 11 teen and young adult children with their one language and their one child together. Their marriage invitation was Mutsun on one side and Pomo on the other. Karina developed a close working relationship with her linguistic partner, that, which has lasted many years, and together they went through every bit of documentation they could find and came out with a complete dictionary just a month or so ago that they had been working on all these years that is available on the web. Uh, just a, one more example, an excellent school teacher named Cheryl Tuttle teaches school on the Round Valley Reservation in um, uh, Northern California. R Round Valley could be called the Four Nations Reserve because four different language groups were put there as part of the process of removing California Indians from their homelands. Unlike here, the languages are completely unrelated to each other. No one on that reservation speaks any of those languages. So Cheryl came to Breath of Life in Berkeley in 2014 to find documentation on the Wailaki language. She herself is not Wailaki, she's Maidu. Because the teenagers at the Round Valley Reservation were interested in learning their heritage languages and Wailaki heritage was the strongest one among those kids. So she thought, well, we might get to all four one day, but we'll start with Wailaki. So she was able to find um, a lot of good material with the help of her linguistic partners. Uh, she had two of them, and uh, the three of those, uh, she and the two linguistic partners now Skype once or twice every week while she develops weekly lessons to, keep, uh, to teach the children, keeping one week ahead of the children and learning Wailaki herself. She brought several of her students to present at one of our recent conferences, and in fact has been going around the country uh, with her students in various conferences presenting, um, uh, presenting the language. Nobody is fluent yet, but they're excited and dedicated to keeping on with their learning of Wailaki. None of this could have been done without documentation. Although Breath of Life was designed for people who did not have speakers to work with, documentation can also be uh, a great support school, uh, tool for people with speakers. For example, the best native speakers of Yurok 
taught a group of younger adults using the master apprentice techniques, but they spoke what the Yurok sometimes called New Yurok, which has a, simp a somewhat simplified grammar and has some new words that have replaced older words for the same uh, concept. So the young adults, now language leaders in their community, are mining the old material for some of these older words and sentence constructions. Now, the reason Breath of Life works at all is that over 100 years of language materials collected by linguists and anthropologists are at Berkeley being cared for in the archives, along with many language materials developed by the old Spanish missions of the 18th and early 19th centuries as well. And the same is the case for almost 200 years of documentation at the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. They may be pickled language, but these old documents can still be vital to people when there's no speakers left. We are running out of speakers in California. Um, so it, I shouldn't say we're running out of speakers. We're running out of first language speakers in California. Um, so more and more tribes and individuals are depending on documentation to continue their revitalization efforts. I think it's clear to most native people now in California that documentation is essential. Furthermore, modern technology allows these materials to be more and more available. Even 75 years ago, in order to copy a document, it had to be copied laboriously by hand. Even 30 years ago, only Xerox copies could be made, and that often degrades the ink through exposure to light. But now the originals can be digitized and transmitted via the web. The Digital California Language Archive was developed just a few years ago, where most of the materials in the Linguistics Department Archive have been digitized and made available on the web. Similarly, the demand generated by Breath of Life in Washington, D.C. has speeded up digitization of some of the materials most in demand by First Nations or um, Native American people, such as the giant collection made by J.P. Harrington, so that now all these materials can be examined online anytime. There's similar progress in audio materials, from wax cylinder to aluminum discs to vinyl to wire to various iterations of tape and now on to digital. As for the wax cylinders, once recorded, you could only play them a few times before the sound would be degraded completely. A few thousand of these wax cylinders are used to, uh, were used to record songs in language of California Indians in the early days of sound recording. Many had been played in the late 70s for transfer to audio tape. Most of them have very poor sound quality with white noise louder than the language being recorded due to use or decay or melting or mold growing on the cylinder. Many are actually cracked or broken and have not been able to be listened to at all. So there's a project going on right now at Berkeley to copy the sound from wax cylinders using a new laser technology developed there by Carl Haber, a physicist in the Lawrence Berkeley lab. A laser camera makes an optical scan of the sound that can then be editing and played. The editing can take out a lot of the noise, which is from the frequencies above and below the human voice, and can also record even damaged cylinders, editing out cracks and scratches and holes. It, must, it, it much improves the sound quality and doesn't damage the wax cylinder itself in any way. The laser recording is a very slow process, just starting, and the project will take at least three years. The project is seen as a kind of cultural repatriation to tribes of these early recordings, and the order in which the cylinders are being re-recorded is entirely based on which tribe asks for them first. The Wiyots asked first, so those are the ones that they've started with. I mentioned earlier that when the advocates first formed, the idea of focusing on documenting the last speakers was rejected, with board members and others saying that we want new speakers, not documents. This attitude is not limited to California. Uh, Joshua Fishman remembers a statement from the Ainu in Japan, says, uh, we will not go into the museum. We will not be archivized. We can still become pregnant. We can still bear children, and they can still laugh with Ainu on their lips. <laughs> 
Some community language activists also fear, quite rightly, that documentation of the last speakers of a language takes away vital time and energy from language revitalization. Here's a statement from Richard Grounds, a Yuchi man who's learned along with his two children to speak Yuchi through work with the few remaining elders of his community. He wrote about an argument he had with a linguist who had worked extensively on Yuchi. He writes, the climax came when the linguist offered the idea that the Yuchis would have a dictionary on their shelves 100 years from now. I countered that 100 years from now, I wanted the Yuchis to have the language on their own tongues. There's an underlying message in these uh, of distaste and distrust of the documenters. Most of the documentation, the old documentation that we're talking about has been done by outsiders, scholars or missionaries, uh, even military men, people with their own agendas and their own, um, and are sometimes not even working in the best interest of indigenous communities. Usually the documentation was not done for the community, but for scholarly study, or in other cases, even for domination. But a number of things are different now. One is that there's a new generation of scholarship that works in partnership with communities and to help fill community needs. And the other is that increasingly the communities are doing their own documentation and developing their own archives. These archives might house copies or even originals of older documentation or might become a place for the deposition of recordings and notes from individual community members who have done documentation on their own or they may house new documentation. There's an increasing number of tribes in California and all over that have begun evolving documentation programs. For example, the Karuk tribe did an intensive video documentation project of the last few Karuk speakers just a couple of years ago. And one young person, one young Karuk person especially, who is uh, apprenticed in the Master Apprentice program has documented every speaker. The Yochidihi tribe in California has been working for the last eight or nine years with their one fluent speaker. And they have a vast digital archive of everything, she tells them. And furthermore, they've made copies of every piece of older documentation from other copies at Berkeley and elsewhere to house in their own language house. Going on to other places, um, I mentioned um, Larry Kaimura, the University of Hawaii at Hilo has a very important archive of Hawaiian language radio reviews done decades ago by Larry, interviewing native speakers of Hawaiian and talking about all kinds of topics. These recordings, which are conversational, of course, in nature, um, these recordings are extremely important for their content, for hearing connected speech from the old first language speakers, for grammatical structures and perhaps forgotten vocabulary, for students trying to perf perfect their accent and intonation patterns, just for so many things. Archive development and maintenance is supported now through organizations such as the Association of Tribal Archives in the US, uh, the Association of Canadian Archives in Canada, I notice, have put out an Aboriginal Archives Guide. And there are um, international meetings now being held on indigenous languages, the next one being in June, this June, I think, in New Mexico. So to conclude, I have not really done justice to the original title of my talk, of course. My original point would have been about what success really means. I think of success as a constant process in flux, not an end point. Every word one learns is a success story. Every time a young person comes to love his endangered language is a success story, whether he becomes a fluent speaker or not. Success is multi-generational. It's something that, uh, that may happen across several generations. Um, for example, the uh, Tolowa tribe in Northern California, there was uh, a woman, we're talking three or four generations ago now, uh, who um, uh, insisted that the community begin 
um, ceremonies again. They had stopped them 50 or 60 years ago. And uh, she got them started again, and her son became really interested in ceremony, and he became really interested in language. And through working with elders, just even as a boy, he was interested enough to, uh, to ask the elders constant questions and, and to become a speaker. He also became a ceremonial leader. But he didn't actually pass on the, the language to his children. Um, as his uh, son described at a recent conference, he said that uh, ceremony was required of us, but speaking Tolawa was not required of us. But the son had a brush of death, a brush with death when he was uh, an adult, a plane accident that he was able to walk away from. And his first thought was, I've got to learn my language. And so he and his father entered the master apprentice program and, uh, and then he also went to school and got a master's degree in linguistics. And he married, uh, and the two of them have decided that they're going to homeschool their kids. So they've been homeschooling their kids for uh, several years now, uh, using as much Tolawa as they can. And uh, they've just gotten a grant to do a, a language family program where it's called Five Families. They're getting five families together who are going to start learning and using their language at home with their children. So I, this is like a four-generation process that we're talking about. So success doesn't necessarily mean something that is completed in our lifetimes. But, um, <clears throat> but I think that it's evident here maybe from the stories I've told, that success in language revitalization is strongly dependent on documentation, either as vital supplementary material for language learning or for the entire process of revitalization when there's no living language speakers. So the answer to Sarah's question, have we documented our languages well enough, would have to be no, even though I know there's a lot of documentation on your languages. You have many linguists partnering with you, many of you who are linguists. You have many, um, I keep seeing incredibly thick dictionaries around of Cayuga, Mohawk, and Onondaga, uh, fantastic documents in themselves, and old field notes and texts await you in the archives of Canada and the US. But there will never be enough documentation. It might be that there's diminishing returns on trying to collect more paradigms or vocabulary, but uh, in this day and age, I would say make recordings as many as you can of connected speech, conversation, stories, whatever. I'm sure there's a lot of that already recorded as well, but there could never be too much in the long run. But Ground's dismissal of the Uchi Dictionary Project is also an important point about speakers' time the speaker's time each day is limited. So how can the speakers best utilize their time for language survival? Shall he teach or shall he record? There needs to be a balance between language teaching and learning versus documentation. Sometimes the two can be simultaneous. Recording, teaching, and learning sessions is one way. For example, I heard a great deal of wonderful Mohawk classroom patter from the teachers of Mohawk 1 and Mohawk 3 yesterday um, from the immersion and from teachers in the immersion classrooms. Um, some of those teachers are second language speakers, but why not record them as well? Great training recordings for future teachers to listen to and learn from. Yet there's aspects of the language that would likely be missed if that were the only form of documentation. We talked about conversation a lot as an important language genre that's underdocumented, uh, as an example. So there's a, a balancing act that needs to be done. But in the cases that I exemplified in California, where the last first language speakers are leaving us, and especially where some languages were hardly ever documented at all, language activists yearn for any and all missed opportunities to document their beloved languages. Thank you. Oh, two of these.
Is there time for questions? Yeah, I, I think so. Any questions for uh, Dr. Hinton? a way to, to help people begin. Um, basically, all you have to do is uh, call an archive in advance and uh, tell them you want to come and uh, make an appointment so that they can um, get out the materials for you. In California, for example, um, a lot of our materials have to be stored off campus. And so you, uh, it may take a day or two to get them onto campus, and so that's why you have to call in advance just to make sure that they'll have the materials ready for you to look at. But there's no kind of like special, you don't have to be a member or that kind of thing? Kind of no, okay. no, not for the, well, the Library of Congress, you probably have to go, you have to go get yourself a card, uh, and, um, and that may take a few hours if there's a long line. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise, though, you're, anybody is really free to come. I'd like to say too that the archives have been strongly affected by uh, the um, uh, by what uh, is being requested by uh, First Nations and Native American people. And uh, for example, the J.P. Harrington um, uh, the J.P. Harrington documentation that I mentioned it's uh, over a million pages that he did during his lifetime and. Those documents have been in such demand uh, by uh, Indians from all over that uh, that was why they decided that their first uh, digitization project to put uh, materials online was going to be J.P. Harrington. So uh, th there really has been a big influence on the archives from what community people have been asking and doing, the, the, the enormous amount of research that they've been doing in the last 10 years or so. Okay, thank you. Thanks.